In 1931, a distinguished Himalayan mountaineer, Frank Smythe, came here to the Royal Geographical Society for the loan of a piece of equipment. A piece of equipment without which there's not much point in a climbing expedition setting out at all. I mean, of course, an altimeter. This is the altimeter Frank Smythe borrowed from the Society to measure the progress of his expedition up one of the highest unclimbed summits of the Himalaya at that time, Mount Comet. Ten previous attempts on the mountain had already ended in failure when in May 1931, Frank Smythe got together one of the youngest mountaineering expeditions ever to face all the pressure of high altitude climbing. It was Smythe's experienced opinion, and I quote, that Himalayan mountaineering depends upon unselfish teamwork, which depends on men who are temperamentally in phase. Your friend in civilization may become your enemy on a mountain. His very snore assumes a new and repellent note. The absurd manner in which he walks, even the cut of his clothes, may induce loathing beyond endurance. The film you're going to see is the work of Frank S. Smythe, an inspiring leader, a brilliant climber, correspondent for the Times, and a talented filmmaker, told to you in his own words. They sailed from Europe in March 1931, arrived in Bombay in April. After two days' journey by train and by motor car, they reached Raniket, a little village 6,000 feet up in the foothills of the central Himalaya, and a hundred miles as the crow flies, from the great peak of Mount Comet. In May 1931, we all gathered together at Runiket for the start of our expedition. Our objective was the 25,400 foot peak of Mount Comet in the Himalayas, as yet unconquered by the foot of man. Our group included Captain Burney of Sam Brown's cavalry as our transport officer. An enormous amount depended on him as he had to manage the expedition's porters. Wing Commander Bowman, the oldest member of our team, and at 39 years regarded almost as the grandfather of the expedition. Mr. Shipton, a brilliant young mountaineer from Kenya Colony. Dr. Green, at six foot two inches tall, would be the first to see over the top of Comet. He was our medical officer and responsible for our health during the climb. Oh, and this is me, Frank Smythe, looking, I'm told, rather like Tom Mix. Mr. Holdsworth was a master at Harrow, a mountaineer, a she-runner, botanist, a first-class cricketer, and an Oxford double blue. As a backbone to our porterage, we engaged ten old Everest veterans from Darjeeling. They are born mountaineers. The toughest was our Sirdar Lewa. His one vice was imagining himself a film star. Nima Dorja was my photographic assistant, a happy little Tibetan with a cheery grin. The most charming characteristic of these men from Darjeeling is their cheerfulness. Whatever the hardships or the dangers, they always came up smiling. Obviously, we had to carry enough food, and preparations took a long time. Each load had to be weighed so that each of our porters had a fair share. From Runiket, we had a superb view of the great snow-clad walls of the Himalayas, rising like some titanic foam-crested reef, across which we had to march 150 miles to the foot of Comet. Captain Burney started the 70 porters on their way. His fluent Hindustani and understanding of these primitive hill people was invaluable. These men think nothing of carrying a load of 80 pounds on their back 15 miles a day in intense heat. They are born load carriers. The water buffaloes kept cool in the streams. And so sometimes did we. There were no Mother Grundies in this part of the world to prevent us sunbathing. So, Regretfully, we left this camp on a delightfully cool ridge and descended once again into a valley. The country became rockier and rockier as we neared the great peaks. Our trail lay along narrow paths across precipitous mountainsides, dangerously exposed to falling boulders. Sometimes huge landslides occurred, damming valleys and forming lakes. 
Our next camp lay on the Kuri Pass, which separates the foothills from the Great Peak. Here we discovered a baby musk deer, a funny little animal only a few inches high. We adopted it as the expedition's mascot and called it Rupert. Next morning, we trudged up over drifts of snow to the crest of the pass. And there we had a marvelous view of the outpost peaks of Karmet, over 20,000 feet high. Pausing on the last ridge, the Himalayas were arranged before us in a stupendous arc. Then we descended down and down into the vast valley of the river Ganges, which pours down from the Himalayan snows to irrigate and fertilize the northern plain of India. Next, we had to cross a bridge which might have been designed by Mr. Heath Robinson. On the far bank lay the holy city of Badrinath. We continued our march through the quaint villages along the Ganges and past many temples. We came across this beggar trying to earn an honest penny by standing on his head and shouting the only four words of English he knew. One, two, three, four. Our march took us along the pilgrim route, where in each village we saw the temples where they pray to their gods. As we continued to pass along the upper valley of the Ganges, the scenery started to change. It grew wilder and wilder and increased in grandeur. Soon, we came to the last ridge of our march. From now on, we would have to ford the rushing mountain torrents. The tall man, Dr. Green, was carried on the back of his diminutive servant. And then came Holdsworth, smoking his inevitable pipe. Closely followed by his beloved she's. Mighty peaks guard this sacred region. Here, the gods live in the vast snow fields over which the clouds move in slow procession. To reach our base camp, we marched up the beautiful Dowley Valley and entered what I can only describe as an Eden of flowers. I must confess that here, as the botanist of the Carmet expedition, I am an imposter, my qualifications wholly inadequate. So I limited my selection to those which I thought would be of value in an English garden. The melted snows from Carmet rushed through precipitous gorges. Giant precipices rose on either hand, and we traveled beneath the cliffs in constant fear of rock falls and avalanches. But to our relief, we arrived safely in Niti, the last village in the valley at 11,000 feet. Here we made camp, watched by the village children. At Niti, we dismissed 60 of our porters and recruited in their stead the hardier local Bhutias, who are born mountaineers. They were a bit suspicious of us at first, but soon became devoted to us. Captain Burney, our transport officer, soon had them organized and selected 30 of these men. We also had 30 yaks to help us carry our loads. At last, everything was nearly ready and we prepared to start our journey to base camp. The yak is a beast of burden. It will cross a narrow bridge without a qualm. It can traverse steep and dangerous hillsides with amazing sure-footedness. But its all-out speed is just one and a quarter miles per hour, a pace only for the patient. Near Kamet, 
we cross this amazing snow bridge formed by avalanche debris. We entered a stony waste of waterborne boulders. And then we came upon a formidable torrent and had grave misgivings as to the possibility of fording it. After much difficulty, we at last managed to get a rope across. Our single-strand rope bridge was secured at both ends with the greatest care and diligence. It was then time for the first expedition member to attempt the perilous crossing. This is the same sort of arrangement by which sailors are rescued from wrecked ships, and to which we now entrusted our lives in the rock-strewn gorges of the high Himalayas. and our luggage traveled across this frail affair. But had I fallen into that raging torrent, I shouldn't have been drowned. I should have been smashed to pulp. But if that contraption was able to transport men and loads, it was scarcely able to cope with yaks. So, one poor beast had to be dragged across the torrent on a rope as a good example to the others. And with yells, shouts, imprecations, and sticks and stones, they were urged into the waters. At first, it looked as if some must perish in the turmoil of the torrent. But eventually, they heaved themselves ponderously onto the other bank, none the worse for their adventure. they all got safely across and continued in their solemn, tank-like way as though nothing at all exciting had happened. Good. The scenery became wilder and wilder the nearer we approached to base camp. The distant peaks were almost obscured by sunlit cloud. At last, the expedition trod snow and made base camp here at the height of 15,000 feet above sea level. <laughs> we were fit and cheery, and we celebrated the successful completion of one stage of our journey with a bottle of the oldest and boldest, and the best our stores could provide. Dr. Green tested our hearts to see if they were fit enough to withstand the strain of great altitudes. Clothing was a vitally important element. As well as several layers of Shetland wool and a windproof jacket, it was essential to protect the ears, face and hands against frostbite with balaclava helmets and gloves. Goggles were also important to prevent snow blindness. And lastly, boots, on one nail of which may depend the life of the climber. Six men were specially selected from our new porters and equipped with warm clothing. Among these was Keisha Singh, who proved to be the best of them all. Food had to be carefully rationed out, for we expected to be several weeks on carpet. We knew that we had to lay siege to Kalmet as though it were a fortress, by establishing a series of camps until near enough for the final assault. To our joy, 
the following morning dawned gloriously fine, with scarcely a cloud in the sky. The summit of Mount Comet, 12 miles away, was just visible over a nearer range, and we set off towards it, hoping to establish our first camp, Camp One. We travelled at first through rocky moraine and snow, with the sun beating down on us. We pitched Camp One above a glacier at a height of 16,000 feet, and our porters were still full of buck and cheer, despite the hard day's work and heavy loads. After the local porters set off back to base camp, our men sat around the camp smoking a horrible mixture of charcoal and yak dung with every appearance of enjoyment. The following morning again dawned fine. We were not yet suffering from the effects of altitude, so we pushed on up, hoping to pitch Camp 2 another thousand feet up the Carmet Glacier. The route was a very dangerous one. Six thousand feet above us towered huge peaks to which clung enormous masses of ice hundreds of feet thick. At intervals, ice walls larger than the Houses of Parliament and weighing tens of thousands of tons broke away and thundered with appalling roars down the precipices. Fortunately, no avalanche came dangerously near us, and we were able to make Camp 2 in a safe place at a height of 18,500 feet in the shadow of Carmet itself. Cooking was no easy matter, but the chef of the Ritz-Carlton did his best, though his concoctions did taste of burnt wood and paraffin. I seemed to be actually enjoying a plateful of burnt porridge, but I didn't always enjoy life and used to suffer from jarring headaches and sleeplessness at this altitude. After spending three days getting acclimatized, we felt fitter and pushed on up to a little plateau high up in the precipices of Carmet. We arrived on the plateau in a heavy snowstorm, but we managed to pitch Camp 3 safely at the height of 20,600 feet. We made this our advance base camp and brought up enough provisions for a month. We wanted to spend enough time here and become really used to the altitude and thus be in a strong proceeding position. From Camp 3, Holdsworth managed to do some of the highest she running that has ever been done in the world. We watched him, a tiny black speck on the side of the mountain, getting nearer and nearer. I couldn't help but admire the expertise of this fine, all-round sportsman. At Camp 3, we prepared for our final camps on Carmet. Every single detail, including even the tins of food, had to be gone into and checked most carefully, for one weak link in the chain of preparations might have defeated us. We set off from Camp 3, our base, to try to establish Camp 4, which had to be pitched on the top of an ice bulge 22,000 feet high. To reach the top of the ice bulge meant a most difficult climb up a precipice of ice and rock a thousand feet high. The first 15 feet must have taken us as many minutes to climb. So difficult was this precipice that it occupied us for no less than three days of arduous and exacting work. At that great height of nearly 22,000 feet, we were finding it hard to breathe, and every movement made us gasp heavily. Steps had to be cut into the steep slopes of ice and snow before we could advance. At that altitude, it was a task involving the hardest possible labor. We found that we'd been deceived as to the apparent angle of our proposed route. 
The couloir was much steeper than it had appeared from the camp. The angle of banked up snow was such that, when standing upright, the slope could be touched with the outstretched hand. After some difficulty, the piton was firmly driven into a crack. It was strangely calm, and the dull thuds of the wooden mallet striking the piton sounded weak and muffled in the thin, frosty air. These spikes had a ring on the end to which the rope was tied so that if the heavily laden porters slipped, they would have something to grasp. Then we came to the steep upper slopes. A slip here would have meant disaster. All around us, the icy billows swept towards Mount Carmet like a tempestuous yet immobile sea. We were approaching the upper slope of ice. Here, one false step would have sent us crashing down to our deaths. It was dreadfully hard work for the porters, who were carrying heavy loads and had to stop and gasp at almost every step. But at last, we reached the top of the ice bulge and made camp four at the height of 22,000 feet. From camp four, we looked up and saw the very peak of Karmat itself in all its icy magnificence. All but nine porters were ill with mountain sickness. So we split up into two parties. The advance party consisted of Shipton, Holdsworth and myself. It was arranged that we should try and pitch a higher camp and then make a final push for the summit itself. As well as altitude sickness, we had to contend with the bitter cold of a camp pitched at 22,000 feet. Tents and sleeping bags were simply not enough. But our next camp had to be pitched higher still on the skyline. To get there meant climbing between huge masses of shattered ice hundreds of feet high. Climbing these slopes to Camp 5 was terribly tiring work, especially for the porters, although we'd taken it in turns to break the trail for them. The snow became softer and softer, and our boots began to sink into it. It was the worst day of all for the porters, but they carried their loads with wonderful fortitude. And where they sank down, we made camp at 23,300 feet. Holdsworth, always anxious to improve his she record, went off to examine the route to the summit from a nearby peak. We had planned to climb up too, but were overcome by tiredness from our efforts. When he returned, Holdsworth reported that the ridge would provide no easy route to the summit. The night was bitterly cold, 60 degrees of frost. There was an unspoken decision to attempt the summit next day. Between the northern face of Karmat and Camp 5 stretched an almost level expanse of snow. The sun shone gloriously over the roof of the world. Next morning, we started to toil up the slope, hour after hour, mere insects on that vast mountainside, taking two breaths for every upward step and gasping for life-giving oxygen. But as we sank down to rest every few yards, we saw that the world was beneath us and realized that we must be nearing the summit. So we would rise to our feet and wearily toil on a few steps more. As we toiled up this last slope of Comet, the wind and cold numbed us. A 
Our feet in particular suffered. Holdsworth's right big toe was frostbitten, and the tips of all Shipton's toes were affected too. We tried rubbing, but it was useless. We just couldn't restore the circulation. Lewa, our gallant Serdar, was so seriously frostbitten that I'm sorry to say he subsequently lost all his toes. The slope got steeper and steeper. 500 foot from the summit was a rock which we climbed with incredible slowness. We approached the final wall of snow and ice, struggling feebly up that last icy fortification, drawing on all our final reserves of energy. For this stage, we had to cut steps in the hard blue ice. But even though physically we were almost finished, there was still something in us which kept us going. And I believe that something is the incomparable spirit of man. In that thin air, everything was a terrible effort. With desperate energy, we drove our feet into the snow. We mustn't slip. For beneath us was a precipice and a drop of a thousand feet. We became mere automatons of flesh and blood, struggling feebly up that last icy rampart. As we struggled on up that last summit ridge, we seized hold of Lewa and shoved him in front of us. I don't think he quite understood what we were doing, but he was thus the first man to tread the summit. It was the least compliment we could pay to those splendid men, our porters, to whom we owed the success of our expedition. It is difficult to render any account of that view, for we, the first conquerors of Mount Kamat, were too far above the world. Our gaze passed almost contemptuously over mighty range upon mighty range, but their topmost turrets could not attain our level. We looked down on a splendor of mountains from our own pinnacle of success. <laughs> 